بسم الله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا ومولانا محمد الفاتح لما أولد والخاتم لما سبق ناصر لحق بالحق والهادي إلى صراطك المستقيم وعلى آله حق قدره ومقداره العظيم ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته So, we've now arrived at the point where marriage is a union of souls. That marriage is a means for me to realize the potential of my qalb, of my ruh, in connecting and knowing and experiencing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's tawheed and in becoming beautiful becoming beautiful in my khuluq, becoming beautiful in my inner character by representing Allah's names and attributes. And that marital change begins with me. Now, if marriage is a union of souls, and we said it was, and if the beauty of my soul is represented in my character and we said it was how well I meant to be the Khalifa of Allah on earth I meant to beautify my soul my qalb with Allah's names and attributes when I do that that is synonymous with akhlaq because every beautiful character is a reflection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's beautiful names and attributes. The character trait of wisdom comes from al hakim The character trait of haya, having bashful modesty, comes from Allah's name as we learn in the text by Rasulullah Al-Hayi in the Allah Hayi the text uh, the character trait of being lovingly merciful Rahim of being grateful Al-Shakur of being patient from Allah Al-Sabur and of of being generous al karim and so forth and so on. So character, if you like, khuluq, are really the qualities of my ruh or my qalb. It's what I look like inside. Are you with me? Does that make sense? We're trying, inshallah, to build an argument as well. Hopefully there's a logic to how we're uh, examining and studying you know, what the Muslim marriage is meant to be. So if now, if marriage is a union of souls, the state of my marriage is going to be the sum of my akhlaq and her akhlaq or his akhlaq. And as you know, as I must know, as I must always remind myself, Hafizullah, that Akhlaq and those inner virtues and characteristics are the essence of what makes a Muslim. It's the essence of what makes someone near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The essence of being a Muslim is two things, Tawheed and beautiful Akhlaq. Tawheed of Allah to affirm Allah's oneness in everything that I do, in everything that I feel, in everything that I choose, in everything I will, Tawheed. Not Tawheed only, that is intellectual. Everyone here knows Allah is one. For sure, all of the people of the Qibla know Allah is one. 
Of that we don't know. But do we experience his Tawheed? That may or may not be true. Tawheed, Tawheed al wujdan your ulama say. To feel, to experience Allah's oneness. Again, in what I say, in what I do, in what I see, in what I hear, in what I feel, in what I will, that Tawheed. And secondly, the consequence of being nearer to Allah is beautiful akhlaq. And so he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as you know, many texts, أَكْمَلُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِمَانًا أَحْسَنُهُمْ خُلُقًا Very beautiful if we ponder it. The most perfect or complete of believers in Iman is the most beautiful of them in khuluq, in character. Iman has levels. And as Iman becomes deeper and richer and more beautiful, it turns into good khuluq. It's like saying, this is actually very powerfully insane, Iman, Islam, Ihsan. And what is Ihsan? But beautiful khuluq, beautiful khuluq in what Allah allows in again, in every aspect of my being, how I feel, what I think, what I will, that I will only what Allah loves. So now marriage is a union of souls. The essence of my soul, what, what makes a beautiful soul? Beautiful akhlaq. If I have a beautiful ruh, I have beautiful akhlaq. It is impossible to say my soul is beautiful, but my soul does not have tawheed and akhlaq. You cannot be beautiful inside. Well, you know, I'm a good person. I'm a pure person. Only if I have tawheed and akhlaq. Now, if marriage is really then a union of beautiful akhlaq, are you with me? If marriage is a union of beautiful akhlaq, can we say marital problems, for the most part, are the result of ugly akhlaq? This is an interesting proposition, right? And we're led to this point almost compellingly by the principles of Deen. It's almost a compelling rational and spiritual argument. If marriages are indeed union of souls, beautiful akhlaq, the idea, the marriage, then marital problems must usually be coming from faulty akhlaq at its root. Remember, at the roots of the tree. The tree is not healthy. The branches are filled with disease, not producing fruit. The trunk is very unstable. Does that mean there's something wrong with the root usuli system? Well, when we develop this course, um, and now part of the Sohba Seminary courses, that that was what was the assumption based on our deed principles. So I spoke to Dr. Human of the Khalil Center. Do you know Dr. Human or do you know the Khalil Center? So the Khalil Center, mashallah, founded by Dr. Human. Dr. Human uh, is um, a, a very serious student of Islamic religion. Very serious. And he's also a professional psychologist, psychotherapist. He's a professor, he's published in academic journals in psychology, and his calling was to produce an Islamic psychotherapy. Take from what is in psychology. First of all, what is our Islamic psychology? 
and he went to the earlier ulama, the texts, the works, and then to use in modern psychology what is in conformity and beneficial in servicing, in serving our Islamic psychotherapy. And he began the Khalil Center in Chicago, I think. It now has offices in many parts of North America. And he specializes, they specialize in dealing with psychological ailments through the original Islamic lens. He lives these days in Istanbul, and so we're neighbors. And alhamdulillah, we become close friends. So I asked him, can we say this? Because we, we did the curriculum for the course in those early days. And then I said, is it true? And then he said, because he has clinical experience now, theoretical experience, academic experience, uh, publishing experience, clinical, many cases of counseling he's done. Is it true? He says, yes, it's true. That akhlaq is the foundational problem in dysfunctional marriages. Okay, next. This is the question for me in the seminar. What percentage of cases that you and the Khalil Center have fielded, what percentage of marital problems are due to bad akhlaq? So here, I usually ask you, don't, I was in Albany, Albany last night, and out of the five or so seminars that we're doing in the summer, they also wanted the marriage seminar. And don't do like they did and say 100%, because then nothing I say is going to surprise you. If you say 100%, nothing I can say is going to make you go, wow. So without that 100%, how, this is, what do you think of marital problems the world over, I was going to say the Muslim community, the world over, uh, has to do with bad akhla, percentage-wise. What do you think? 75%. 75. Is that too high? Remember, we're being quite reductionist. We're saying, you know, what percentage is due to bad akhla, zoning in on it as the cause 75%? Says Sheikh Ali. Who else says something else? Does that sound too ambitious? Sounds too ambitious, right? 40%, okay. Okay. Remember, don't trust me. <laughs> I'm, being, I'm being this, uh, I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to fool you. 40%, who says more? Less. 60%, okay? Last one? He said 95%. A Muslim practicing person of ilm, clinical psychologist, academic, says 95% of marital problems are due to bad akhlaq. Now, if that's the case, it means 5% of marital problems, let's even assume it's not necessarily the case, are almost kind of unchangeable. Let's assume that. We don't have to actually, but let's assume that that's what it means. That means 95% of marital problems can be made better by changing who? by changing me. 95% of marital problems can be made better if I only got myself out of the way. Myself, my nest out of the way. Now, what's really interesting when you really ponder this more, and alhamdulillah, see that just follows from our deen. Our deen is so rational, so logical, spiritually rational 
and intellectually rational, that it's an obvious conclusion. It was almost obvious. I was, we were so sure it has to be a cloud. And then he simply confirmed it empirically. Basically said, yeah, 95%. So when you ponder this more, it's, it gets equally interesting. So the, the, mer <coughs> the marital couples here, how many of you have read Men Are From Mars and Women Are From Venus? Or you're too shy, uh, I'll start. But okay, don't tell my wife. I think she made me read it. I, I skimmed it and I got the summary. I don't think I read the whole book. But I think she said you have to read it. I think that's why I did it when we first got married. And I, I got the gist of that. Who of you have read, you know, love languages? Usually it's a lot more of the sisters that read these, 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 these books, of which they're quite beneficial. Right? What are the five love languages? I'm going to test them now. What are the five languages of love? Do you remember? Words of affirmation. Words of affirmation? Physical touch. Huh? Physical touch. Physical touch? Giving gifts? <laughs> Forgot already? Sisters, you should know this. You know? Acts of service, fifth one. This is this is the key, at least in my home. Quality time. <laughs> Quality time. Quality time. So what's the premise of the book? It's simple. People express love in different ways. And people interpret love in different ways. If you're expressing love by words of affirmation, but your wife understands love as gifts, she will not be feeling love. You have to speak her love language. Right? It's interesting, and I'm sure, no doubt, it has some truth to it. But look, we all knew that, at least some of us did. But what does it take, truly, to give words, well, that's, yeah, words of affirmation. Uh, something a bit simpler for an example. What does it take to give gifts? It takes the chuluk of being generous. <laughs> it takes the chuluk of being generous. I need a chuluk in order to do what secular marital therapy tells me I need to do. And of course, these are not the only problems in marriage, love languages, or even, you know, different communications. There are other problems in marriage that arise, and all of these are elements of some of the truths. But look, it depends on a choluk. What does it take to listen to your spouse with full focus and empathy and not drift off into space or enter, as males do, the man cave. What does it take? It takes a lot of patience. And it takes a lot of ethos to give of what at that moment is difficult to give. Attention, for example. You had a bad day, but she had a bad day too. Now, to listen to her, to truly listen, or vice versa, it takes a lot of ithar. And ithar is a khuluk, to prefer someone else's needs over yourself. Giving gifts, I need to be generous in order to do that. So no matter how we look at it, you cannot escape from the foundations of khuluk. And all of the other secular marital therapy, therapies, if they do have some benefit, many of them do, they're contingent, actually, on a proper usul, which they don't have, which is the usul of akhlaq. 
Let's take what you might think is a very odd example. And this was given by Dr. Human. Because when we had him on the course, one of the questions was give examples of marital problems that have at their basis hulu. He gave this one, which is really interesting. Physical intimacy problems. Basically, you know, lopsided issues. We would say, how would we put it? Uh, problems in physical intimacy, right? Uh, unmet physical needs. What's the khuluq that needs to be developed in order to deal with that problem? Yes, there are technicalities. For sure, meaning modalities. How do you solve some of these problems? Khalas, you studied it, you are an expert, you may have ways administratively to deal with these issues. But what's the essence of it? Dr. Human says, generosity. He thought, you sacrifice for the other person. I don't want to do something, right? But the other person has certain needs. I make the sacrifice. It comes back to a khuluk. There might be some details here, of course, but it comes back to a khuluk, ultimately. So if I'm not developing the khuluk, I'm not solving my marital problems, because I can know about, you know, empathetic listening. I can be an expert in the theory. I still have to do it. I still have to find the patience, find the ithar, find the rahmah in me to be able to do it. And that takes mujahid. It takes struggle and it takes an essence of tazkiyah, of wanting to purify my khuluq and my soul. So, we've arrived at this point that marriage is union of souls, the institution of marriage, alhamdulillah, to fulfill the beautiful usul of our deen, like the role of a khilaf, uh, of khilafa, of being a khalifa, marriage being a union now of akhlaq, which is the essence of my soul. Now, what if marriage is a union of souls, what is the, the deepest intimacy except spiritual intimacy? The deepest intimacy in a marriage, if it's not a marriage of bodies, it's not physical intimacy. Though, of course, that's important. And it's an objective of the objectives of marriage. But if marriage is a union of souls, of awah, of kulu, then the deepest intimacy is at that level. At the level of the ruh, at the level of the qalb. Spiritual intimacy, akhlaqi intimacy, is the deepest level of intimacy and the deepest form of intimacy. Marriages with akhlaq last. Marriages for akhlaq last. And marriages with akhlaq, they only become more beautiful. You see, your spouse, news real, but it's not really news, is getting old. <laughs> And as he, she gets old, they get gray, they get wrinkles, they lose so much of what may have initially drawn you to them. But if they're getting more beautiful at the akhlaqi level, that marriage is becoming more spiritually intimate. And that marriage is actually becoming younger at the spiritual level. And so the deepening, the deepening of akhlaq by both parties leads to a deepening of spiritual intimacy of uns. See that sakina li taskunu ilayha, li taskunu ilayha, that sakina is not the sakina really of, well, let's go on a vacation together. 
let's watch football together, let's go to movie night together. And that's, that's not really what's going to produce. If it is jayas, that's fine to do that, do that. But real sakina is only going to come from a deepening of akhlaq. And so we find, for example, Rasulullah mentioning this in a beautiful text. He said, Tunkakul Maru Afwan, Tunkakul Maratu Li Arba'in. He said, A woman is married for four. Limaniha, for her wealth. Wali Hasadiha, for her lineage. Wali Jamaliha, and for her beauty. Wali Diniha, and for her deen. Fal, Fal, Bidat, Deen. He said, so be successful, basically, be successful in choosing the one of thee, or else. So I can marry someone, a woman, or a woman can marry a man, for many reasons. They could be wealthy, good lineage, beautiful, all of which are fine to get married for. The hadith is not saying, don't marry for beauty. It's saying don't marry only for beauty at the expense of deen. So if one has all of them, alhamdulillah, fabiha wa na'imah, that's wonderful. But the most important aspect of a marriage is lidiniha or lidini, for his or her deen. And his or her deen doesn't mean they just said the shahada. It doesn't mean they're just a Muslim. Lidiniha, the depth of her deen, the depth of his deen, and that depth lies in akhlaq. So he's saying, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if you want to be successful in marriage, if you want a loving marriage, a permanent marriage, a deepening marriage, a youthful marriage, find someone who has the essence of deen, which is beautiful akhlaq. And we find that most beautifully expressed in almost every dimension of the ultimate story of hubba between two people. And who would that be? Say, say that Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Every aspect of the description of her and their relationship shouts out the principles of a union of souls. Everyone. And you can't help but be incredibly affected by actually any description of her. It's just because, as some of the ulama said, that of the awliya, of the most special friends of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, apart from the messengers and prophets, she is the, the queen of them all, the king of them all, even. Because she was from the Ahlul Bayt, and she was, if you like, the source of the Ahlul Bayt. And she, some of them had said, is the greatest of the awliya. Radiallahu ta'ala anha. And that's a very powerful argument. If you ponder it. Who was she to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Every time Sayyidah Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha says, every time he used to even leave the home, he would praise her. Ayyadkuha dawman. يثني عليها دوما أثنى عليها He was always praising her رضي الله تعالى Always praising her When he gets a gift صلى الله عليه وسلم Imagine that He gets a gift He says Send it to the The friends and the relatives Of Sayyidah Khadija رضي الله تعالى What does that mean? Where is his mind? Where is his heart? Who's occupying his mind and heart that the gift is given? He sacrifices something, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a sacrificial animal, and he says, give some of the meat too. 
the friends or those that know Sayyidah, it's like, you know, those who know her become very special with him. So the law has those who know her become so special with him because of who she was. The more we ponder that, that relationship, who did Allah choose for his Habib to be the mother of his children? To be his Anisa, to be his Mu'ina, to be his Musa'ida, who except her, radiallahu ta'ala anha, then it would be, it would be almost, you could say, in some way, a duty for us to explore that, but it would be very difficult to explore only her, her merits. Uh, and probably would have to do, if we're able to, uh, a course about just her, radiallahu ta'ala anha, and what she represents of elegant strength of independent service, of, of feminine autonomy. She had incredible personality of strength within femininity, of resolve within the haya, of kuwa within, within lean, within gentleness. An incredible balance it is truly shameful that we would look as women or men towards any other exemplar of what a woman is by bypassing her radiallahu ta'ala anha. And so he said when he was told, you know, in some of those, and it really is beautiful because he was the the wisest of them all. And you wouldn't, in a relationship, mention a former wife, would you? And he was the wisest of them all. But, but it has to be mentioned who she was. And it had to be conveyed who she was, even when he was speaking to his beloved Sayyidah Aisha, and this happened many times because we have many texts when she became very violently jealous, radiallahu ta'ala anha, and as though his heart could not but express, could not but express this incredible khuluq of Sayyidah Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha. So he said, قَدْ رُزِقْتُ I was given as a sustenance her mahabba love. قَدْ رُزِقْتُ حُبَّهَا Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. رَضِيَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى عَنَا رَضِيَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى عَنَا رَضِيَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى عَنَا So, the next part is this akhlaq, a union of akhlaq. Now, what would be some of the akhlaq of marriage? Because we don't have much time, what would be some of the akhlaq of marriage? There are many akhlaq, but I'm going to mention ten. The akhlaq that build a marriage, the akhlaq that break a marriage. The akhlaq that build, the akhlaq that break. The akhlaq that break are the opposites of these. The akhlaq that build are these. To mention them very briefly, with this important caveat, all of these are equal opportunity akhlaq. What does that mean? A man must have them, a woman must have them. No difference. Some of them, a man must have them more. Some of them, a woman must have them more. And some, only a man can have. Or only a man should have. Let us say that. And only a woman should have. So the ones that everyone must have are the following 
and you would know them, but only to emphasize and evaluate. Um, a while back, we had a discussion with some teams, and some of them were resolved in getting married. Alhamdulillah. Some of, some of them were university, early university students. And then we said, okay, let's do an akhlaq test. Because now we got to this point, your marriage is all about your akhlaq. How ready are you? So, checklist, 10 akhlaq, rate yourself, you know, from 1 to 10. And then, then some of them said, I'm not ready. I'm not ready. Because not only should a marriage have this, I should, I should have this if I want to get married. This is how I prepare for marriage. I don't prepare for marriage by getting the apartment only or essentially. I prepare for marriage by having in me these akhlaq and by seeking someone who for the most part has an acceptable galaxy bouquet of these akhlaq. Rahma, compassionate love, sabr and hilm, patience and forgiveness, shukr and qana, being grateful and being happy with the basics. Being happy with the basics. And that's why he said, of the reasons why he said, وسلم, that the marriage of most baraka is the easiest one. And that's why he said, and that's why of our teachers, when uh, a woman demands, or her family demands, a mother that's very high, that's a red flag. It's not a green flag. It's not a yellow flag. That's a red flag. I thought it was a yellow flag. To be honest, when I was counseling, uh, brother, I found a perfect, perfect sister. Impossible. But okay, fine. Keep going. No yellow flags. Alhamdulillah, impossible. Keep going. No red flags. Okay? Continue. But she wants $20,000 US in math. I said, that sounds, sounds quite a lot, to be honest with you. I think that's a yellow flag. I spoke to one of my teachers. He said, red flag. <laughs> And I'm saying this for a reason, happy with the moment. Red flag. She can say she's simple all she wants. She can say I'll move with you wherever you like. But when she says 20,000 non-negotiable, that's a red flag because of why? It indicates something of akhlaq. What happens if you marry someone who's demanding in that material sense, like that, well, you will not be very happy, rest assured. Come and do to be generous and giving, not only in material resources, but in energy, in emotions. Lean and rift, easy going, to be easy going, relaxed, gentle. Iqtisad and i'tidal, to be balanced, moderate, and ifa, to have you know bashful, sensitive modesty. And by the way, for a man to have rira, that protective care, protective jealousy over his family by caring for them, by wanting to protect them, and that comes in different ways. That's beautiful. That's an angelic khuluk. A man doesn't like his wife to speak to other men. And modern, modern modernity tells him, suck it up. What's wrong? Just jealous? You know? Let her be free. Why 
why are you trying to stifle her? You know, control her. Limit her independence. What a load of nonsense. You can't be a man if you don't have real. You can't be a ruh if you don't have rira over your family. And of course, a woman, similarly, if a woman doesn't feel uncomfortable with her husband fraternizing and intermixing with other women, there's something wrong. Meaning, our fitra has been bent and twisted in ways that are very unnatural. Because that's a beautiful, angelic, Feeling. Of course, as long as it remains within proper shari bounds, everything can be excessive, for sure. But as an initial feeling, it's beautiful. It's part of the war. It's part of beautiful khuluq. Ithar and khidmah. To be selfless and serving. Service is like a dirty word. But it's a beautiful khuluq. It's how some have reached Allah Azza wa Jal through khidmah. Allah has many paths to reach him. One of the paths of, of reaching Allah's nearness and becoming very special with Allah is the path of khidmah, of service, of serving others, of serving your family, of serving your husband indeed, and of serving your wife. In different ways. That's part of the beautiful khuluq. You don't want, you don't want to marry someone who thinks that service and khidmah is something ugly or something that in some way renders them less quote unquote free. Shura and khidmah, you know, to be wise, to be wise, to consult. Now of the two that are gender specific and you will forgive me because I'm, I'm being direct <laughs> this is as direct as I can be but if we're not direct about certain things because of the political atmosphere how do we learn and how do we change and how do we have good marriages and how do we return back to our usul if no one wants to speak about what sometimes must be spoken about and so he, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, encourages men to be wary of one foot. And you know the text, and it's so rich if only we approached it with a clean mind and a clean heart. He said, a woman, Khulikat min Bilai, she's created from a curved ribbon. And then he said, Wabiha Iwaj. And this, this curved root, it has, it has a curvature to it, it's not straight. وَإِنْ ذَهَبَتَ تُقِيمُهَا كَسَرْتَهَا وَكَسْرُهَا طَلَابُهَا And if you try to straighten this curved rib, you will break it. And breaking and, and, and trying to straighten it and breaking it, that's talaq. So, it's like telling men, look, women have a different nature. One way maybe to look at this is women have a nature infused with EQ, that an emotional quotient. Just like men tend to be more linear and more instrumental in their thinking, women are not like that. Women have a different nature. So, and this happens all the time in marriages. From the beginning and even all throughout marriage, there's a marital challenge and the husband says, a wife says, here's the challenge, here's the problem, and the husband says what? Hey, it's a simple solution, really. <laughs> Just do X. Right? And then it doesn't solve the problem. Your wife is still unhappy. And she's more unhappy because the problem might be multi-dimensional that involves interests and emotions that have not been really addressed. It's not the problem, it's sometimes it's what, it's what lies under the problem. 
And the mere nature is very instrumental. It's like, that's so obvious. I have to solve that A to B, draw a straight line. But sometimes, sometimes, especially in space time, there are no straight lines. Lines occur. And the only way to get from A to B in a certain dimension is through a curved line. You can call that the feminine dimension, if you like. And so Rasulullah is telling us men to have more patience in wanting to impose or generalize their own nature. Sounds good? I remember when I was younger, this used to come up all the time. And Sheikh Jamal Badawi, his team, he was always in these sorts of fora. He had to explain this, that it's not what you think it is. But hopefully it is what we think it is if we look at it with a certain lens. And then, so that's for men, be more patient and be aware, beware of imposing, imposing upon Allah's creation what cannot be imposed due to the way Allah made that creation. For women now. That he said, famous text, authentic, authenticated by the masters of hadith criticism who have no axe to grind whether it is pro-women or against women. The ulama, with their hearts, with their minds, they simply report for them or against them. For men, against men. For women, quote unquote, all of this is in quotation marks, or against them. So, this famous text in which he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in his mi'raj, I saw most of the inhabitants of the fire were women. What does that mean? The ulama have kalam on that. What does that mean? At that moment, etc., etc. And then he said uh, in the text that they did kufr. And then he clarified what sort of kufr it was. They were ungrateful to their husbands. And they were ungrateful for goodness done to them. That's the ungratefulness of the kufr that they were guilty of. Now, far from it being a critique for the seeker of Allah, it's a gift. Tell me what my faults may be on average and I'll make sure not to do them. So he's saying on average, so Allah has said them, women are ungrateful to their husbands. On average, they are ungrateful or they have that as part of the byproduct of their nature, as men have things which are part of the byproduct of theirs, like the first sex. That is, that when you're good, and then he gave an example, you're good to her all the time, and then something she sees in you that she dislikes and says, I have never, ever found any good in you. The generalization, the universal statement of unhappiness. And he said, the intent of this, to be grateful, to be grateful for the ihsan of your husband upon you. And of course, men ought to be grateful too. That goes without saying, because we said all of these are both for men and women. And if a wife is grateful, and this is by, by even experience, if a wife is very grateful, it produces in the husband a tender receptivity that is reflected back on the wife to fulfill her emotional needs. So if we don't take prophetic advice, we program ourselves to be unhappy in our marriages. And I can jump up and shout and scream and say, well, but I'm a feminist, but 
say whatever you want. You don't follow Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. You make yourself miserable. Follow his way, and you will find that what you need of happiness, what you need of fulfillment, will be fulfilled by the barakah and the truth of what he brings. Sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wa sallam. And lastly, of the khuluq that is, as you know, only for men, is to be men. Is to be men. And to be responsible, loving leaders. Collaborative, responsible, loving leaders. And of the khuluq that only women can express, is to be women to be feminine, not to be masculine, and not to buy into modern isms and philosophies that ultimately only imprison women by making their standards men. That only imprison women in the guise of emancipating them because the standards of what women ought to be are actually the definitions of what maleness is. Ponder that, perhaps. Lastly, Hafidhukumullah, and of course, forgive me, part of a woman is to be lovingly obedient within the shop. That's part of what only a woman can do. In the same way that a man is meant to be a loving, responsible, wise leader, a woman, a Muslima, a Mu'mina, a wife, is meant to try to be lovingly obedient. No social structure can survive without some level of hierarchy. We obey our bosses. Is there a problem there? Men and women. I obey my father. He's another man. He obeys his father. He's another man. There has to be some social hierarchy of leadership and of obedience for any institution to function. That's so obvious, it ought not even to be mentioned. It's so obvious in the workings of society, you would think you wouldn't have to mention that. And it's not genderized in that sense. I have to obey my father. I expect my son to obey me. I obey my mother in the ways that Allah Ta'ala has assigned obedience. To the extent, I was listening to one of your ulama, he wanted to do his PhD. His father said yes. His mother said no. He said, I obey you. And then later she said yes. We don't obey others because of their makhlukiyah. We don't obey others because they are created beings. We behave, we behave, we, we obey them because of Allah's imperative and what He has placed in that of wisdom. Lastly, Hafidhullah, there are 10 golden rules of marriage. We can't cover them all, we can't cover even most of them. I'm going to mention simply two of them. This one should be clear. Marriage is a training field for my soul and for my akhlaq. If this is what marriage is, as we said, it's a training field. It's a lab in which I can beautify my akhlaq. My relationship with my wife tells me a lot about me. My relationship with my children tells me a lot about me. I can look at it as all about the other, but then how will I learn? And marriage, by the way, will bring out of you the deepest parts of you that you never knew existed. Because of that life and the challenges, alhamdulillah, and the children and the unexpected twists and turns of marriage and the pressures and the personalities, it will bring out of you what you will be shocked at. 
And if that is negative, and often it is, Alhamdulillah, now I know something about me. And now I can become better. Alhamdulillah, thank you, husband. Thank you, wife, for showing me, me, for revealing to me, me. That's the attitude of a Muslim, of a woman. Let me know what's in me. Not let me blame, blame, blame. Let me grow, let me grow, let me grow. Marriage is a shrinking field for me and my akhlaq. And everything in marriage says a lot about me. If I take that perspective, isn't it liberating? Isn't it beautiful? Isn't it optimistic? Number two, a good marriage is happy enough. A good marriage, there is no marriage that is bliss. There is no bliss in dunya. Dunya is dunya. Bliss is in gender. A good marriage is happy enough. That's not to say let's all shoot to be mediocre. No. We're trying to be the best we can, to be the most beautiful in our akhlaq that we can. But let me be grateful. Let me realize that my spouse is dunya. And dunya is always stained. There is no pure dunya. Nothing in dunya is pure. Everything is stained. The only pure is Allah, al -Qudus. And the only bliss is bliss with Him in general. So if I am practical, pragmatic, a good marriage, alhamdulillah, is a happy, enough, is happy enough, it will never be perfect. I think my wife became really happy in our marriage when she realized, you know, marriage with you, alhamdulillah, is good enough, is good enough. And actually, I'm interested in Jannah. I'm not interested in Jannah in this marriage, it will never be. And I said, Alhamdulillah. Uh, and when we realize that, that's a level of spiritual maturity that actually gives quality to the marriage. It will make the marriage that much better because it will infuse in it gratitude, sugar, contentment. I'm happy. I'm not constantly unsatiated, insatiably seeking perfection, bliss, you must demand it. The worst, one of the worst things in, the, in marriage is arguments and being demanded. Argumentation and being demanded. Be easy, be happy, be grateful for what I have. And I have so much. We have so much. If we count our blessings, we would not be able to we would never be able to truly enumerate them, even in our marriages, even when it appears more night than day. Uh, so those are two of the golden marriage rules. There are eight of them, uh, but we don't have time for them right now. Do we even have time for the... Five minutes. Five minutes, okay. So I'm not going to do the presentation, but I'm going to say this. Uh, forgive me. Uh, we're part of the software seminar.